don't know me, I'm a recruitment trainer and coach and blogger, and I'm based just out of Melbourne. And today we are going live, courtesy of recruitmenttraining.com and also gitscore.ai. And on that note, I'm going to welcome in my co-host. Good morning, Mike, and uh, please, uh, great, great to see you and tell us a little about our sponsors today. Sure. Well, first of all, a pleasure to be working with you, Ross. I mean, you and I go back, what, 13 years now. So on my trips to Australia from the UK over the years, um, you know, I've heard a lot about you and it's great to be great to be working with you. Um, yeah. So um, recruitmenttrain.com, um, check it out. One week free of over 820 recruiter videos. But in particular, we've got the world's first reality recruitment videos that upskill experienced recruiters they're real game changers that's all free so i'm not going to pitch that just have a look at it um and then uh our sponsor is gitscore.ai um that's very relevant actually for today's session because if you today's session is how to fill more vacancies guaranteed now for anyone in technology recruitment you'll know that github has 100 million candidates on it if you don't know that i'm going to repeat it because it's 100 million has a lot of candidates and uh git score again you get this free for 30 days um git score analyzes the um github profile uh, for, for accuracy of the code and therefore when you submit a cv to a client you're almost certainly going to get an interview because you can prove the skills uh, automatically so that that's uh, that's our two uh, sponsors excellent and uh, we'll provide another reminder about what's available via recruitmenttraining.com towards the end of the session today. All right, well, let's uh, kick off. Mike, you want to start with the first topic? <clears throat> yes, sure. So um, if you want to fill more vacancies, part of it is structure, isn't it? It's actually um, how do you plan your desk and how do you structure your desk and what, what tools do you use? So I'd like to dive in with a question for you, Ross, about, I don't know, the top three biggest mistakes you see when recruiters are working a desk. Sure. And I think, I mean, this, this will probably sound like back to basics, but in my experience over 21 years as a recruitment trainer, inevitably the biggest gains that people can make uh, are actually revisiting the basics. And the most significant one for me is that too many recruiters are working on low quality jobs like their high quality jobs. Now, there's nothing wrong with working on a low quality job, um, but you just don't want to overinvest time in it. And this is one of these things I just consistently see. A job that might be worth two or three hours of your time, recruiters are investing 10 or 12 or 15 hours thinking that if they invest their time more, that it's going to increase the likelihood that they fill it. But in most cases, it doesn't. Why? Because the client's not committed. They're working in competition with too many agencies. The client's not paying the appropriate market rate. The client's employer brand is pretty bad. Uh, all of those things recruiters don't seem to consider deeply enough and therefore invest too much time in a low quality job. So that's that's the first thing. Second thing. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I said three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, second thing is, and this is the number one complaint, the number one complaint from candidates, Mike. What do you reckon the number one complaint about recruiters uh, that comes from candidates? Uh, not not hearing back. Exactly. And again, it sounds so basic, but a couple of my friends have been looking for work recently. And guess what? Complaining about recruiters say they get back to me and they don't get back to me. We know that it's harder to initiate and get a conversation with a prospect than ever before. And building relationships with candidates is sort of the back door to getting work, either because those candidates may become clients later on or those candidates are influencers with people who are hiring managers. And just the lack of discipline that many agency recruiters have about calling candidates back. And it doesn't mean they need to have a conversation with the candidate. It, it could simply be a text message, it could be a voice message, it could be a LinkedIn message. It doesn't necessarily need to be a conversation, but just get back to candidates. That's like, it still boggles my mind 
that our industry is generally pretty crap um, at that. And then the third thing is, and I know you and I are very passionate about this, Mike, it's that recruiters are trying to go too wide in a market rather than go deep. Specialisation is really where you win the recruitment agency game. Going deep, really knowing the difference between the candidate that's an eight out of 10 and a candidate that's a nine and a half out of 10 really knowing the difference in market value between different types of candidates, being able to produce a candidate that a client is astonished by because they've been searching for six weeks themselves, never seen a candidate of this quality. Why? Because you've got deep networks. You're known as an expert in that particular area and candidates, the best candidates, come to you because you're an expert. So there'd be my top three. I, I could list another 10, but um, how about you? What else would you add to that list, Mike? Yeah, well, some great advice there. I think just dovetailing on, on your point about talking to candidates and staying in touch with them. The title of today's session is How to Fill More Vacancies Guaranteed. One way to fill more vacancies is get more candidate referrals. You get more candidate referrals by talking to people. Now, um, again, is this basic? I'll tell you what, it's not based upon my experience because I've listened to over a thousand call recordings and um, they end with, hey, John, good to have a chat with you. Speak soon. Bye. They're not asking for a referral most of the time. Now, there's a real skill in developing referrals. And by the way, we have some great material in the reality videos in recruitmenttrain.com. Check it out for free, by the way, just... Please, please do that. Um, but it, it, it's huge. You want to fill more vacancies, become better at getting referrals. So that's one. But if you look at structuring the desk, have a template job order. Now, um, I, I see recruiters, and one or two of you participating today are going to have a rueful smile. And you're taking vacancies on the back of a post-it note. Stop doing that. You know, have a template job order pre-prepared with the best questions on it already. Now, those, a template job order will take you to new business. A template job order will take you to fresh candidates. A template job order will protect your fees. So if you're in a tight market and you're getting, you know, prospect clients saying, oh, you charge 25%, my current recruiters only charge 15%. You know, you're up against it unless you've got fee defense questions. So structuring your desk to include templates with cleverly thought through questions means that then you've got business consistency. And the, the rookie mistake to make here from directors is thinking that templates are for rookies. They're not. Templates are for the biggest billers in the business. And, uh, and I build a million pounds in one year in my best year. And I always use the template every single time. It's actually a weapon. It's a weapon you can use on sales meetings because on the sales meeting, I can uncover that my competitor is not asking the detailed questions that I'm asking. And then I can point out the ramifications of that. And then I can show them my template and walk them through it and point out how the additional questions will make the job easier to fill for them. So that will be a key point for me. Um, the second thing is, um, again, how to make vacancies, uh, how to fill more vacancies guaranteed is to put this phrase into your mind. It's your job to make every vacancy you take easier to fill. That's it. So that is a central mantra to take away from this session. Make every vacancy you take easier to fill. So those would be some of the key ones from me, Ross. Yeah, look, I, I love the template advice and I can't reiterate enough the importance of everyone using a template because this is, this is the metaphor that I'd use, Mike. Um, so, Mike, after how many thousand hours are airline pilots allowed to stop using their checklist, their pre-takeoff and their in-flight checklist? They never stop using it. Exactly. But surely a pilot after 10,000 hours doesn't need a checklist, do they? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Like, to me, every single airline pilot flying every single plane 
no matter how much experience they're required to use a checklist because one small mistake could cost what mike um well if it's a flight of course the plane could go down and everyone... exactly <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly and the same thing with the recruitment checklist okay no one's going to die but the vacancy could die like no people are going to die but the vacancy because you forgot to ask a critical question and it's just like such an obvious thing that so many people do and like you i was using a template until the day i I actually stopped recruiting and it is one of the easiest things to do because guess what there's a lot of information that every recruiter is um having every day it's hard to remember everything and the template just makes it easy to ask the critical questions that make the biggest difference absolutely and it's a living breathing document that, that improves over time you know so if you if you build your own template that's fine if you get uh, some external advice um, where you've got somebody else's template um, and you can build upon your own and then learn from that um, and, and refine it you know so li little questions and uh, let's just give one example here how many times is this question asked at the end of taking a vacancy when would you like them to start now what control does that give you over the client not much because the usual answer, nine times out of 10, is ASAP, as soon as possible. So a better question might be, what's the latest possible start date for this person before it causes you, the team, or the business a problem? Now, that can give you control. Now, I can't go into fine detail of that right now, hmm. but just imagine how that might pan out and how you can use that, that question to, to your advantage. Um, so let's let's move on to um, time avoiding time wasters and dealing with the best clients. We've kind of hinted at it a little bit, Ross. You know, with um, uh, investing more of your time in the better quality jobs. But what tips would you have to for recruiters to focus in on the best clients and avoid time wasters? Well, you want to identify are they going to actually pay your invoice so a discussion about the terms and conditions of business up front is something that i find a lot of recruiters are reluctant to do they feel like having a conversation about the terms having a conversation about the money having a conversation about the payment terms uh the guarantee is kind of like oh you know it's going to be a difficult conversation and it might get awkward but to me that's a test like, is this a client that's really worthwhile investing in and discussing your terms at the time that you take the vacancy, having the conversation, not just saying, oh, I'll send you our terms or here are our terms, can you sign them and send them back, but actually going through the major points. And the major points are how much you're going to charge, the basis of that charge, how it's going to be invoiced. So is it a retainer? Is it you're going to invoice once the candidate's accepted or does the candidate need to start? What's the guarantee? And also, what are the payment terms? And that conversation up front can flush out a lot of the time wasters. So when you actually have that conversation and you gain an agreement, you can go back and start working on that vacancy with confidence rather than you start working without the term sign, wondering, are they going to push back? You do two or three days worth of work and then the client comes back pushing back on certain terms and your negotiating position is significantly weakened because you've already invested this time and you feel compromised that you need to agree with whatever they're pushing back on because otherwise potentially you're not going to get the vacancy and you're not going to be able to leverage the time you've already invested so that 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 would be my major tip what about you uh gr great advice i think if we go back to the template again um, I'm just going to give a little anecdote. So I got into a, a FTSE 100 company, um, the largest 100 companies in the UK. Um, uh, through, through a call, it was actually a verbal reference call on a previous candidate, which is a great business development technique, still underutilized, by the way. Um, so I'm in this conversation, I pick up a vacancy. I spend quite a lot of time on that, really interrogating um, the position. And I said, um, uh, how happy are you with the level of detail I've taken today? And she said, uh, it's excellent. 
And I said, um, who else have you spoken to about this role? And she'd spoken to one other recruitment company. And I said, ah, when did you speak with them? She said, literally 10 or 15 minutes before I spoke to you. I said, just out of interest, how much detail did they take in comparison to me? And she said, not much detail at all, really. How long were they on the phone to you for? She said, just a few minutes. So how confident are you or not in their ability to fill this role without wasting your time? She said, well, putting it that way, Mike, I'm not that confident. I said, well, I'm very confident I can fill the position and I believe I can save you the time and trouble of having to deal with that other recruitment company. How happy would you be to work with me exclusively on this position? And I'll put a team behind it to find the very best talent for you. And she said, yes, that's fine. I said, okay, let, let me just double check on what we're agree we are agreeing here. What, what you're saying is that even if the other recruitment company by chance happens to send a CV that looks right, you're going to disregard it based upon the fact that I've got more detail and more information and less likely to get it wrong for you. Is that what we're agreeing? Now, not everyone's going to agree to that, but she did, by the way. So um, the detail gives you power. Um, now, if I, by the way, we filled that job and took over on the account, FTSE 100 company, and we had, we, about a month later, we signed an exclusivity deal with, with the whole uh, team. So, but back to detail and dealing with the best clients, and to your point, uh, addressing the terms and conditions. You see, if you can take the detail, really interrogate it with a template, with question after question after question, and you get to the end of that conversation and you say, how happy are you with the level of detail I've taken today? How does it compare to other recruitment companies you've dealt with in the past? Oh, it's far better. Now, even that on its own, there's more by the way, but if something is far better, it costs more, correct? So um, the, the clients just told you, so when they say, oh, my current supplier charges 15%, Mrs. Client, if I could take you back a moment ago, you very kindly said, I'd taken more detail than any other recruitment company you've ever dealt with. Thank you for that. You also said, and then there are, there are fee defense questions you can utilize to slot something else in at this point. And, and it's actually very, very comfortable and easy to deal with terms and conditions at that point, because even if the other supplier is charging less, they can, they can see the value. Um, so for me, I would say there's that. There's also, um, categorizing the vacancies. I mean, at a base level, you know, put A class, B class, C class. Um, if you, on a more sophisticated job template, you can have some other checkpoints, you know, face-to-face -face meeting, cooperative, uh, dealing with the decision maker, um, terms and conditions agreed. You can have a, a variety of things ticked that categorize it as an A class vacancy. Um, they're, they're exclusive maybe, or they're retained. A B-class vacancy is workable and has many of those things, but um, you know maybe 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 there's one other recruitment company working on it, and you're still prepared to work the role because you think you can fill it. C-class, you got a question: Do I even want to work the role at all? You know, I interviewed somebody when I ran uh, I ran a recruitment company, which was um, London, Edinburgh, Dublin, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Auckland, Wellington, and Bangkok. And we grew the business to 120 staff. And I interviewed um, through a rec to rec a 400,000 pound biller. Um, and I was quite excited, you know, there's not, not many of those that suddenly fall into your lap as a, as a director. And when I interviewed him, he looked shot. He looked, you know, so I felt sorry for the guy. He, he looked really um, burnt out. Um, and I said to him, how many vacancies do you work on at one time? And it was multiple, over 20, 25, I think. And I said, um, how, do you, how do you decide to invest with the, the most time with certain vacancies? He said, I don't. I thought, why, why is that? I can fill any vacancy. And I thought, ah, that's why you're burnt, that's why you're burnt out. You know, so he, he didn't understand that, you know, focus on the money, A-class vacancies, maybe a B-class vacancy. Um, but the, the real secret of getting dealing with the best clients is to close them before they even work with you. You know, and again, I'm, I've listened, to, as I mentioned, to over a thousand uh, call recordings of recruiters. Not many people are doing this. 
Um, and we've built the reality recruitment videos on the back of real call recordings and then analyzed them for improvements. But the point I'm making is, if you want to get to better quality clients, close them to work with you exclusively before they have a vacancy. That's the way to get the best clients. It's an, out, it's an outward facing attack. You know, you're meeting prospect clients who recruit regularly and then you train your recruiters so that the end of that meeting, if the client is not hiring, is yes, I'll call you exclusively when I next hire. Now that's raw sales ability and you, it, it's trainable. But to get to the best clients, that's a that's a big tip I would say. Yeah. So let's move on to time management, Ross. Um, what what are your top tips for time management? Because this is important if you want to fill more vacancies guaranteed. So this is um, because I actually want to circle back to something that you said, which is to do with time management, and that's the uh, the point that you made about more detail. And as many recruiters will experience, that they'll get a pushback. They'll get a pushback from HR, they'll get a pushback from internal recruitment or the hiring manager, which says, I don't have time for a longer conversation. I don't have time to meet you to talk about this brief in more detail. Other agencies don't need more time. What do you need more time? So firstly, you should expect this response as a recruiter, and then you should be prepared to say exactly this, oh, well, that's good news that you're short on time because if you and I invest 30 minutes now in talking about this job and really digging into what's important, that will save both you and I hours at the back end because this is going to help me in my sourcing and referring the very best and most suitable candidates for the job. Because if I'm just looking at a job description or if you're just giving me five minutes, that's not going to help in terms of the management of my time or your time. So that to me is what every recruiter or a version of that that they feel comfortable saying should be ready to go the moment that you hear, I don't have more time to give you because it is a completely predictable excuse that you'll hear from the other side. I, I love it, Ross. You know, it, it, everything in this job is selling and there are objections everywhere, hidden objections. And that is a hidden objection that recruiters are just accepting. Hmm. You know, so um, another one is, um, and th this is important if you want to fill more vacancies, is uh, well, everything's on the job description. I'll email it to you. Yeah. And, and it isn't. So for me, I'm confronting this. I'm going to be confrontational here. So, Mr. Client, there are some questions that I need to ask that I guarantee the answers to which will not be on the email job specification that you send me. And yet they are critically important to avoid your time being wasted and to help you fill the job with the best candidate. Yeah. Now, that's a confrontation that normally flushes out because it's like a challenge isn't it i mean i'm not aggressive by the way but i hope it doesn't appear that way but it, it's a challenge and it's well what are these questions then and surely that's what you want you want them to think well what are these questions and that's where you can then use your expertise so you know positioning the company more attractively in the marketplace so that better quality talent wants to work for your client that's a skill that all recruiters should have. Now, if they don't have that, work on that skill. But one simple question, which is not asked very often, is um, let's say the client's called Jenny. Um, Jenny, um, tell me, please, how many people have you hired in the last few years? I've hired 15, Mike. Okay. How many of those have been quickly promoted? What are they doing now? Four of them have been promoted. One's now heading up the Brisbane office. One's had a 30% salary increase. My goodness, this is gold. This, this is the gold I'm searching for from you, Jenny. Because when I headhunt a candidate, um, I don't just want to say I've got a job with great prospects because they hear that all the time. I want to be able to say to them, really, you're ambitious. I've just speaking, been speaking to a client of mine who told me that four of the last 15 people she hired got 
promoted within 12 months. One of them is now heading up the Brisbane office with a 30% pay increase. Does that sound like the kind of career advancement that might suit you? So you've got a real anecdote straight from the client. So again, that might be a question you want as a prompt in your template job order. Um, these things, you know, they require some thought, but once you get it right, it's dynamite and you will fill more vacancies. Yeah, and look, I've, I've, I've got my own favourite question there. And this is a classic example, again, as you've highlighted, something that will I can absolutely guarantee you not be on the job description. It's what I call my Whitney Houston question. Do you want to know what my Whitney Houston question is, Mike? I love Whitney Houston. I'm intrigued. <laughs> so the question is, um, or it's to do with how will I know? Okay, do you remember the Whitney Houston hit, How Will I Know, if he yeah, really I, loves me? Put it in my head, Ross. <laughs> so uh, back in the late 80s, the Whitney Houston hit, How Will I Know, she's singing about the protagonist, if he really loves me. So as a recruiter, you want to ask the client, so Miss Client, how will you know that when the person starts this job at the end of three months that they're successful? How will you know at the end of six months that they're successful? How will you know at the end of 12 months? Now, why? Now, of course, some job descriptions have key result areas or accountabilities, but what they won't have that might be a question and might be the answer to the, to the question about the first three months is the hiring manager says, look, Ross, the incumbent who's just left was effing awful and there's a complete mess and so the success is of this person when they start is I stop getting complaints from customers about how their accounts are being completely screwed up. So at the end of three months, if I stop getting customer complaints or they're reduced by 80, 90 percent, that will be the success measure. So it's that sort of information that you're just not going to get in a job description. But if you ask the question, the how will I know question, you're more likely to get that juicy information, which will give you great insight into the type of person who's likely to be suited to that job. And also it makes um, a more accurate brief to the candidates about what they're likely to be walking into. So that's my Whitney Houston question. I, I love it, I love it. You know, when I, when I train recruiters on a key part of taking the job brief, which is the selling benefits of the company, I play a little game. And I, you know, I would stick a $20 bill uh, or I pull a $20 bill out of my pocket. There's six recruiters in the training room. And, uh, and I say, right, we're playing a game now. And people normally lift a little bit when you do this. I say, okay, the game is, you can, I'm the employer. You've just taken a vacancy from me. And I want you to ask a question. We're going to go one after the other um, that, that helps you to sell the job to a candidate. It can be anything, okay? Now, the, the rules of the game are as follows. If you can't think of a question, I go, mm -mm, and you're out. If I see that you've duplicated somebody else's question, therefore this is testing your listening skills as well, I go, mm -mm, and you're out. And the last person standing gets the $20 bill. And, you know, it's so much fun. People, it, they could be earning 100 grand more you know, and, and, and there they are, desperate to get the $20 bill. Um, and that game tends to go on for at least 10, 15 minutes. Now, they're asking question after question after question after question after question. Now, of course, in the real world, you, you wouldn't do it quite that way um, because there, you, you, there comes a point you're going to have to stop. And some of the questions are a little bit iffy. I let, I, by the way, in the game, I let them go, you know. So uh, do you have a... Um, do you have a personal massage at your desk? You know, somebody asked me that once. And I thought, well, I would never ask that question, but for the purpose of the game, I'll let it go. Because if they did have one, it would allow you to sell the opportunity a little bit, you know? So you're not going to ask all the questions. What it teaches recruiters is there are more questions that you could ask than you are doing now, even very experienced recruiters. So a key skill and a key, a key business winning skill is to be able to say to a prospect client, when I come down to see you, um, we'll explore some areas in which I can help you inject cost and time savings in your hiring strategy. And I'll also share 
some things that we've helped other businesses to do to position their companies more attractively so that better quality talent wants to work for them. Now, who wouldn't want those two things as opposed to, I'll come down and talk to you about your recruitment. So the developing that skill where you can position their company more attractively is, is massive. So I did take us down the garden path because you asked about time management and I know we need to move on to improving thank, the thank ratio. You. Time, Ross, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of ironic, the time management question, and we're, we're not sticking to our time schedule. But before I ask you about improving the proportion of candidates that get to client interview for those that you've referred, just a couple of quick things to say about time management. Again, they might be really obvious, but stop being run by your inbox. You know, so many recruiters are terrible at time management because they keep their inbox open all the time and they're just reacting to their inbox. That's a terrible way to manage your time. Just firstly, recognise that that's, that's what you're doing. There's nothing necessarily wrong with having your inbox open, but just feeling like you need to respond to it. And it just becomes very difficult to focus on other things if all you're doing is responding to your inbox. Rarely... Is it going to make a difference if you wait 30 minutes to look at a message? Rarely is it going to make that difference. The second thing around time management, and it circles back to one of the earlier points about candidates getting pissed off about not getting return calls, is simply capture your commitments. So as a recruiter, if I say, Mike, um, I'll call you back, then I need to capture that, which might be I put it on my tasks via Outlook, it might be that I write it down, but whatever you commit to, whether it's to a candidate, to a client, to a colleague, capture it. Because otherwise your, un your unconscious mind is trying to hang on to this commitment and it crowds out your mind's ability to focus. And this is one of the, again, just a really basic thing that I think made a big difference for me back in you know the 90s, when I was really starting out, just the old A4 Spirex notebook, just writing every single commitment down. Now, this is not necessarily a to-do list, or it could be, but it's just every commitment that I make, because then it maximises the likelihood, one, that you fulfil on your commitments and gain a good reputation for doing so, but two, it frees up your conscious mind to actually focus on the things that make the biggest difference to your day to day. Um, so that's that's just what I'll add to time management. So perhaps let's move on to. Well, actually, Ross, just want to jump in a little bit. Some great points, yeah. and I think we do have enough time. Um, so time management. Yeah, if you Google uh, the secrets of time management, you'll get probably a hundred million pages telling you pretty much the same things. Have a to do list. Uh, set goals. Be organised. Have a plan, you know, prioritize. So those are all useful things, by the way, but they're not secrets, are they? Because 100 million pages on Google tells you, tells you those things. The secret of time management is efficiency. So you've got to search for efficiencies in everything you do. Now, we've hinted at some of those today, Ross and I. Have a template job order, you know, qualify the vacancies, make the vacancy easier to fill. I mean, my goodness, that one, make the vacancy easier to fill. I'll repeat it, make the vacancy easier to fill. If you make the vacancy easier to fill, of course you've got more time because it's easier to fill. You've got more candidates for the role. So, but the efficiency piece goes across everything. So how good are you at handling the objection that, that Ross dealt with earlier? You know, the, look, I don't have time here. If you just let that go, you're less efficient, therefore you've got less time if you're able to deal with an objection. So really you should look at every aspect of the recruitment job. Um, what business development tactics are you using? Go, go into minute detail on this and you know, grade yourself on a scale of one to 10. It's a, it's a, it's a good exercise. You know, how good are you at handling all my recruitment goes through HR, one to 10? How good are you at handling uh, I'm too busy to meet you? one to 10, 10 being the best in the world, by the way, you know, and then refine those skills. Now, I mean, I was billing a million in one year and I'm sat next to other people who are doing a hundred thousand. They're equally intelligent, if not more intelligent than me. Um, they've got 
personality, they've got good work ethic. What was I doing differently or better than them? Well, there were two main things. One is I became better and better and better and better and better at the skills. Refined, refined, mm -hmm. refined, practice, role play, weekly training, by the way. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I would say these are, these are some, of the, uh, some of the most important things, certainly for, for time management. Yeah, relentless follow-up. Like, I certainly did not consider myself to have any particular natural gifts as a recruiter. But one thing I did do is I was a relentless follower upper. Like, I would be diligently making notes in the database about when I needed to contact that person next, and I would contact them. And, you know, when I was contacting, the most common thing that I would hear just before I got a vacancy, Mike, the, Go ahead. The person would say, oh, Ross, I was just about to call you. And you know what, Mike? Bullshit. They were <laughs> not about to call me. It's just I happened to call. If a consultant from Michael Page or Hayes had called that person before me, they would have said exactly the same thing to that consultant. They would have said, oh, I was just about to call you. But it's just like I was there and the person was like, supposedly about to call me? No, absolutely not. But because I was relentlessly following up, they it, gave the job to me. It's massive. And again, how to fill more vacancies guaranteed. It, it is relentless. You know, there's, there's a phrase that sticks in my mind. If you want something doing, give it to a busy person. Mm. You know, my, my father-in-law, he passed away a few years ago, but, um, you know, he, he used to come to... Um, our mar marital home and um you know if, he's a very busy guy he was um he was a, actually a politician and and then he'd disappear and uh, he'd be in my garden and i had a big garden he's more in the lawn and i'm saying alan come and have a beer you know and he said no no i'm okay i'm happy and then half an hour later he's washing my car <laughs> and he was like if you so he was the epitome of if you want something doing give it to a busy person in recruitment there are parallels You've got to be relentless. You've got to be task driven and you've got to get efficiencies across everything. Candidate sourcing, become more efficient. You know, you want to fill more jobs. You want to fill more jobs guaranteed. Well, li listen to this. There are 40, four zero different ways to find candidates without the web. So I'm removing LinkedIn. Nightmare, eh? I'm removing GitHub. I'm removing the internet in its entire, entirety. There are 40 ways to find candidates without the web. How many of those do you know and use on a, on a consistent basis? You know, so if, you, if you've got greater skill, you become more efficient. Again, I, I, let me isolate one of those to, to make it real for you. What's your reason for leaving? What's your reason for leaving is asked today 2 million times in the global recruitment industry. How many times do you go deeper and uncover that the real reason for leaving is not career move. It's there's a new manager and everybody hates the manager. Now, the natural ending to that conversation might be, okay, John, I'll put you forward for the role. Well, by the way, that manager you described to me sounds a bit of an ogre. Yes, he is, Mike. Just out of interest, how many other people feel the same way as you? And another three, they're all with similar skills to you and they're all looking to leave. Now, these are simple things. Is that time management? Absolutely, it's time management. So moving on to the next question, um, in, improving CV sent to interview ratio. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about first interviews per week. I mean, clearly, this depends upon the seniority of the roles you're working on. And, you know, so it may not be a precise answer across the whole industry. What, what do you see in the market for, you know, first interviews arranged, uh, Ross, and, and how do you think they could secure more? Uh, well, I, I would say for, I mean, it varies greatly according to the market, but I tend to see around seven or eight first interviews arranged in a week's probably about the, the average across Australia. 
Um, obviously, if you're in a temp or contract role, it might, it might be higher depending upon whether you need to book interviews for those sorts of roles to be filled. Um, but it also depends upon, of course, the skill of the recruiter. But I'd say around seven or eight, what's your experience? Well, um, I would say probably sometimes less than that, unfortunately. You know, I got a call from my business partner some years back. And I said, hey, how you doing? And he said, you won't believe what I came across in my garage. I said, go on. He said, I found my first interview book from the early 1990s. He said, I, I arranged 26 first interviews in one week. And he, and he said to me, what's changed, Mike? What's changed? So there's a skill to arranging more interviews, which means you will fill more vacancies. And, and one of those skills is what... In, in my business, we used to term a verbal interview. And a verbal interview is securing verbal commitment before you send the CV. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so basically, when you take um, a vacancy, you, it's not, you can, if you wish, um, say to the client, or I'll fast forward, there's a, uh, a buy every other day, a Teams meeting in the diary with your client, pre-booked at the time of taking the vacancy and on that team's meeting you know you're selling it to the client well, you'll give them market updates you'll update them on progress you'll be able to discuss candidates with them and in that call you'll be able to get the cv on the screen and now if you send that cv to the customer and it's not quite the right match you're probably going to get an email sorry not right Whereas you're able to justify because you've selected the person, you know they're right. And if you know they're right, you've got to get an interview for that person. If you don't know they're right, you're not, you're not fully there doing your job to the highest level. But let's assume you've done it to the highest level and you know that the person is, is suitable for the role. Then you're doing the candidate an injustice. You're doing yourself an injustice by not arranging the interview. So you, know, you can then go through the, the rationale and get the interview. So for, for, for me, you know, it, it was often this. Uh, right, John, i uh, got somebody for you for tomorrow. His name, his name is Dave Jones. Um, he's got the right background. I'll get the CV across to you later. How's three o'clock for you? And I got to that level with clients where I was able to do that. But the mistake people think here is, yeah, but Mike, that's because you had a relationship with the person. The relationship is built like that through sales ability the way you take the job brief, the, the, the way that you position it, the way that you draw the client down the pathway, that's a sales skill. Hmm. So you can arrange more first interviews. And my old business partner who said he got 26 in the week, that's a lot of what he was doing. You know, people call it old school. It's not, it's new school. You know, it, this is a sales job. If you think it's not, join to get another job somewhere else because it is it's a sales yeah. job. you make more money if you're if you've got the highest level of professional selling ability so to add to that mike the power of context and so let me explain what i what i mean by that um so first mike how much time does a client spend observing all the things we do as an agency recruiter to bring two or three qualified candidates to them as shortlisted candidates? They have no idea. They just exactly. press a button and the CV arrives. Exactly. So what's their assumption as to how much time we've invested in doing all of that work? Uh, limited. They think we have a database of candidates and... Uh, we charge them twenty thousand dollars and therefore they want to negotiate because you didn't do much work exactly and who can blame the client unless we educate them otherwise so a simple education tool is what i call the funnel technique so this is this is how i would do it so say you're my client mike i'd say um so mike what i've done is firstly i considered around 120 candidates that came up on my long list from that, I narrowed it down and I spoke to 12. And from those 12, I had a thorough interview with six. And from those six, I've selected the three best for the first interview with you. The three 
who didn't make the cut, first one, not convinced that they really wanted to leave their current role. I think they, they were fishing for a counter offer. The second just had an unrealistic expectation as to what they're worth in the market. And the third, to be quite honest, when I did a bit of digging, I found that they were someone who my colleagues had experience with and frankly, not to be trusted. So I've excluded those three. So let me briefly explain the three that I've selected for first interview. So it's the power of context, using numbers, having the client, and of course, I'm telling the truth. I might also say, and Mike, all of that took me around 10 hours or whatever it might be. So that might take 90 seconds to actually say that, but the client in their mind immediately has a sense of the work that I've done, the process that I've gone through, and I've created scarcity in the client's mind. Scarcity motivates. We all, we all know that. And so I'm far less likely, not guaranteed, but far less likely to have that pushback, that classic pushback from the client, which is, oh, Ross, they sound okay, but can you keep looking? They sound okay, Ross, but could you send me over a couple more? When you go through the funnel, far less likely to have the client say that, far less likely that, that, that they're going to resist the booking of the interviews, much more likely that they're going to agree that, yes, let's get these candidates booked in and interviewed. I absolutely love it. And a very similar methodology to, for me uh, too, Ross. So some great, some great tips there. Um, you know, we talked about efficiency earlier on. Um, uh, send me a CV. It's the biggest objection in recruitment. You know? Forget, we, well, don't forget, but internal, internal recruiters, it all goes through HR. I'm not recruiting. Send me your details. I'm too busy. Those are common. They're common. But the, the hidden objection is send me the CVs. Even worse is the recruiter volunteering to send the CVs. Yeah. You, if you want to improve your CV sent to interview ratio, you've got to follow the advice that Ross just gave. Absolutely. And you've got to make it your mission to control the client to see the people you recommend. That's where you really start to cook on gas. So write, write down, you know, send me a CV and think of what are you going to say next time? Like this is objection handling. It's objection handling 101, really. So let's move on to interview prep because uh, that's another facet of filling more vacancies guaranteed, Ross. Mm -hmm. So... Um, in my experience, and I've got a, some evidence of that, interview preparation can improve the interview to placement ratio by 40%. Um, why do so many recruiters either not do it or do it ineffectively? Uh, I think the first thing is they assume that candidates are better at selling themselves than they actually are. Uh, they also assume that candidates will do more research about the opportunity than they actually will. And recruiters forget how much um, knowledge they have as a recruiter where just even a five minute conversation with a candidate to give them two or three tips could make a huge difference to the outcome of the interview. Because as we all know, the resume largely gets the interview but it's the interview performance that secures the job. And there's nothing more frustrating than having a candidate that you know is excellent for the job, but they blow the interview and the client just simply won't consider them because they answered one or two questions poorly. So I think that's why um, far too many recruiters just don't think deeply enough about the difference that preparation can make to a candidate's performance at interview. What's your view, Mike? Well, it's a very skillful um, intervention. And, you know, it's not as simple as, right, the interview is tomorrow, this is the client, this is the location, good luck. You know, the, 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 the mistakes I see in interview prep are the recruiter telling the candidate what to say. That's a mistake. Now, you've got to coach them. So if the client asks you, where will you be in one, three, and five years' time, how will you answer the question? You know, those types of things. Um, and then you, you're sense checking what's going to happen. You can correct potential blunders. 
Um, but you know, a, a friend a friend of mine used to run a recruitment company in, in the UK called Select, and um, he had thirty six branches. He, and he was a master at um, interview prep, um, and he realised that he should um, develop the skills of all his people to become hopefully as good as him. He called it the magic wand. I've actually filmed him doing this, and it's a fantastic session. His name's Rom Romney Rose. And so he, the magic wand, he then went in, trained 18 branches in the UK, and so pretty much one a day. And then several months later or whatever, he then trained the other 18. The uh, placement ratio improved by 40% with the wow. ones that had had the training. Now, but there is another aspect of interview prep that a lot of people don't do. And that is preparing the client for interview. Mm. You know, and the question you've got to ask yourself is, if you've got a grumpy client, you know, okay, so tell me why we should hire someone like you. Now, okay, they're probably never going to do it that way. But I'm, I'm portraying, yeah. you know, potentially your worst nightmare there. Could be worse than that. Um, how do you get the client to sell to the candidate? Well, it starts on the first time you interview your candidate. You personally interview them. What are the five most important things to you in your next career move? A, B, C, D, and E. Um, to your point earlier, Ross, be fastidious about making notes. Get that on the database. Later down the line, I'm calling my client. Let's call him Dave. Dave, um, Jenny's looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Now, I've headhunted her. Um, uh, so she wasn't looking to move before I made the call, although she does now have another interview through another source. Um, now, I've managed to find out the five most important things to her in her next career move are A, B, C, D, and E. I understand you're very strong in those areas. If you want to secure her, can you bring those into the conversation? Yes, Mike, thank you. Now, that alters the tone of the interview slightly, and of course, it's selling to the candidate's needs. Mm. So let's move on to counter offers now. We've got about eight or nine minutes, Ross. Um, as we said, we keep this to the hour. Uh, counter offers can kill billings. Uh, what do you see and what's the solution? Well, let's look at the reality of the market in Australia, uh, Mike. Uh, unemployment's less than 4%. Almost every single good person is in work. And as the evidence clearly shows, and I see this time after time, that candidates are way more susceptible to a counter offer than they will actually tell a recruiter. So you're naive as a recruiter if, if you believe wholeheartedly the reason that the candidate offers up that they want to leave their current job. They are susceptible to a bigger title, to more money or whatever it might be. So you should act that way in the first interview. In other words, if I'm interviewing you, Mike, and I'm getting towards the end of the interview, then I might say, so Mike, it's pretty clear from me that you're good at your job. It's pretty clear from me that you're valued uh, where you are at the moment. So when it comes time for you to resign, I suspect your boss, Sophie, I think she, uh, you said her name was, I suspect Sophie is going to be pretty disappointed. I suspect Sophie is going to attempt to turn you around and put a counter offer to you. So if that happens, what would a counter offer need to contain for you to seriously consider it? Okay, so I'm confronting the reality. I'm not trying to avoid it. And this is the thing that recruiters don't want to do. They, they just don't want to talk about it. They just don't want to talk about a counter offer. They think if they mention it, that it's somehow going to put it in the candidate's mind. Well, hello. It's going to be there anyway. It's better that you're on the front foot because what I'm looking for is that you, my candidate, Mike, you say, yeah, look, there's nothing, there's nothing that Sophie can do. The company's too small. Unless she leaves, there's no opportunity for me. So I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely leaving, okay, which is great. Or you hesitate and you go, ah, oh, I don't think that'll happen. Okay, but what if it does, Mike? Like, what would it need to contain for you to take it seriously? And I'm looking at you all the time. It's not just what comes out of your mouth. It's your body language. What are you communicating to me about your vulnerability to a counter offer? Because let's face it, Mike, going back to time management, 
how much time gets wasted if I take you through a whole process and then at the end you accept a counter offer? It's a complete waste of my time and it diminishes my credibility in the eyes of my client because I've put forward a really good candidate, Mike, who the client's excited about and offers the job and can't secure. Like that is going to piss them off and undermine my credibility. So that's my sort of number one piece of advice. Confront it in the first interview. Be on the front foot because the reality is for the best candidates, it's always going to be there. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I, I call it the counter offer seed. So I'm seeding reasons not to take the counter offer from the first conversation with the candidate. So, um, you know, they give me their reason for leaving. I delve deeper. You know, on a scale of one to five, five being most likely, how likely are you to stay with your current company if they offer you blah, blah, blah? Okay, so I'm going to get a, get a number. Who have you spoken to in your current company to be sure that you can't get that? Name gathering, by the way, which can sometimes be valuable. Um, and sometimes I'll advise them to go and talk to that person um, first. But if, if they say, look, I'm definitely out of there, I use this phrase. I don't blame you because when I seed one of 10 reasons not to take the counter offer, I don't blame you because, you know, who wants to work for a company that only offers your true value at the point where you resign for one of the 10 reasons not to take the counter offer later on when I'm doing interview prep, how are you feeling? We talked about the current counter offer, blah, blah, blah. I don't. And then, they give me the same uh, spiel. I don't blame you because, and I give them another reason not to take the counter offer. Then I do it at the point of resignation. You know, so I think you've got to be on top of this. Uh, again, it's a separate skill. It's trainable. It's learnable. But those will be some tips in the time we've got left. Yeah. Um, just one other point as well, Ross. Um, we talked about uh, Gitscore.ai sponsoring this event. Um, and there is a value for making vacancies filling more vacancies as a result of this. If you work in technology recruitment, um, what gitscore.ai does, it goes into GitHub and, and it can read the GitHub profile and, and, and check the quality of the code. It's an absolute game changer. I mean, cards on the table, I've invested in that business. So, but I'm not, so I'm not pitching it here. I'm, I'm bringing it to the fore because it's free anyway. Just access it. But you can actually get more interviews as a result of saying putting the the git score analysis of the code on their cv when you submit it because you, you can actually prove that they are the best candidate for the role with the right um, technical skills so that's a little bit about git score so we've got a few couple minutes left ross and we're moving on to retainers which is quite a meaty subject but i would say a lot of things we've covered today are going to help you fill more vacancies but if you want to lift it another level, you've got to be exclusive or retained. Now, um, of course, if I've got six exclusive roles and they're all relatively straightforward, I'm probably going to fill all six. If I've got 20 vacancies, you know, nine of them are C-class and I'm working those roles because I've not qualified them properly, then my time's all over the place. I'm going to bill less. So... You've got, to, you've got to get exclusive or retained roles. Now, I gave a clue as to how to get more exclusive roles, and it starts earlier than you think. It starts on a sales meeting, the first ever sales meeting, where you close the prospect to commit to work with you exclusively the next time they hire. Now, um, we haven't time to delve into that in, in fine detail today, but it's readily achievable with sales ability. So let's assume you, you get more exclusive roles. That's great. But the next level up, of course, is retainers. So, Ross, any any final tips on exclusivity or retainers before we wrap up? So my my normal training uh, session involves about 10 or 15 minutes covering this point. But just given we're down to the last 60 seconds, the most important thing is that you communicate to the client how it's to their advantage that they give you the retainer. Because if all they hear is that it's to your advantage, that's not compelling at all. And the most significant reason why it's to their advantage is that it will allow you to do the deep work to find a better caliber of shortlist to present to them. And there are some subcategories of that, but um, I don't have time to go into that today. But that that is the sort of headline point. 
Yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, I was talking about retainers to a recruitment business owner. And he said to me, Mike, you're out of touch. You know, you can't get retainers anymore. People, people don't want retainers. It's sales ability. You know, three years ago, I did a retainer on some graduate trainees. There was uh, six graduate trainees, £4,000 fee each, or £25,000 of fee income. So I pitched an assessment day when the client paid a retainer up front on the projected um, fee income, 50% of the fee up front. And then we just went to found the candidates and trained them up. That's, that's a retainer, different than you might be doing, but it's a retainer. And then um, a client of mine, he has £100,000 per month retainers on direct debit, more or less, every month coming into his account. So that's a different kind of retainer. That's um, a big scale project where the client's hiring hundreds of people and you put a delivery team together and you pitch the client the value of this and whatever the deal structures. And then you can reconcile, you know, the amount of vacancies filled against the money that's coming in. Uh, but more mainstream, you know, if it's an individual vacancy, you've got to establish the degree of difficulty. So how, how easy or difficult do you perceive this role to be to fill? How often have you recruited for this role in the past? How long did it take you to fill? What were the issues involved? How easy do you, or difficult do you think it is to fill this time around? Now, if they're saying, oh, yeah, it's very difficult. It took me three months last time. The effect on the business was blah, blah, blah. You're leading them down the path of a retainer. Um, and, and again, you know, with more time, we could delve deep on it. But maybe, maybe the best thing to do is if you go to recruitmenttrain.com and take up the free access for a week, there's no credit card or anything, by the way. It's just totally free. Um, there's 820 videos. Just search for the word retain in the search box. And there are some very powerful videos in there that will take you through step by step how to sell retainers. And there's also a couple of the reality recruitment videos where you see a real conversation with a recruiter and a client reenacted. And then it asks you to pause the video and, and you, what would you do next? And it makes you think. And that's going to improve your critical thinking. And then you press play and then the rest of the video is revealed, showing you a better outcome. But in short, the summary on retainers for me is it's sales ability. Mm. And the guy from 10 years ago, sadly, was a, you know, I'd say he's a dinosaur. You know, he, he, his view was it can't be done. And as Henry Ford said many years ago, whether you, whether you believe you're right or whether you believe you're wrong, you're right. You know, so you can convince yourself things can't be done. It's a sales job. The better you become at selling, the better you become at objection handling, the more efficient you become in many of the areas that Ross and I have explored today, you will fill more vacancies guaranteed. So Ross, it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you today. Any final thoughts? Look, just to say it's been great, Mike. I've really enjoyed it. We've organized this as a one-off. So if you're enjoying this, if you'd like to see more, the best thing is uh, connect with Mike and I on LinkedIn. If you're not already connected to either of us, send us a LinkedIn connection request and give us some feedback. If you'd like us to do it again, then let us know and we'll look at doing it again. I've really enjoyed it. And thanks to um, recruitmenttraining.com and you, Mike. It's been great. Great stuff. See you again, Ross. See you See again, you. Mike. Bye. Bye.